Good evening, everybody. My name is Nancy Easterling. I am the executive director here at the School of Scholarly, and I want to welcome you to the second event of our 2020 Speaker Series. If you had any doubt, tonight was going to be fun. As you can see, my presenter, oops, the other door came down. If you have a title, never play mud, I know your first is going to be fun. Well, let me first give a shout out to for the 13th season. Thank you to our sponsor, the Bubble Company. Um, it has been 13 years of bringing wonderful presentations to thousands of people every year. And we are so glad. If you're watching us tonight, please tell all the Boeing friends how much we appreciate their support. Thank you for starting tonight. Thank you for starting the partner years ago. Um, as you all know, we have this live event this year, but COVID got in play. So not to be daunted, we were going to go forward with this. We had to go to this year not to bring this event to the world. We did find two good things about going live, even though we missed them terribly. The first is we we'll record these sessions. So if for any of your friends who had tonight, tonight, they get to watch later at their own convenience. In fact, our very first speaker, Alan Taylor, is available right now on our website and on our YouTube channel. The second is time to join us for our speaker series. Last time, we had more people than ever join us for the evening. We had people from far away from Florida in California. So we are glad that the regional speaker series expanded, even though we miss you. So this presenter came to us from some of our dear friends, Meredith Taylor, and they said, we know that Deb is perfect. We know that you, if maybe we could get him to agree. And as you can see, he wore his mask for a season because he's very happy for this. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about our fabulous presenter, uh, Mr. David Allen, who will be talking to us about his work locating, researching, assessing, and preserving some of the historic sites. So let me tell you something about him. And yes, I have to put on my glasses to do this. So terrible as you get to this. So he started in the Navy the surface wharf and our officer for those of us who were Navy for many years, including tours in Vietnam. He, uh, he attended the law school after all the studies in South East He was in private practice in the of international law in the world. A proctor of international law to the United States, corporate counsel to present the line, a trial attorney. Oh. Um, I think we're having trouble with our audio, so I'm going to turn on to David, um, who is fabulous at every level and is a retired professional who is now pursuing underwater archaeology. So, David, please, everybody, come into the chat room. Let us know you're here and put your questions in. I'll ask David later. Thank you, Nancy. Glad to get rid of the mask. Um, I am not an archaeologist, nor was meant to be. I got into this through the salvage law side and got interested in, in archaeology. I came to the D.C. area to be the lawyer for the supervisor of salvage and diving. They sent me to London on a, for a conference on underwater explosive cutting. And the conference was crashed by a professor of underwater archaeology who took everybody to task for conducting salvage instead of committing archaeology. And I made the mistake of talking with one of his uh, graduate teaching assistants. And I said to her, surely it's better to bring up something from the seabed than leave it all there. And that's the wrong thing to say to a passionate archaeology student who was uh, two thirds right. I was Yankee. And I was ignorant, but no, my parents were married. Um, that was my introduction to underwater archaeology. And, and then through the Maryland Historical Trust as a volunteer, 
and then through the uh, Virginia Department of Historic Resources and later on the St. Augustine Lighthouse and Maritime Museum. I've been very active in it for about 30 years and it is a full-time hobby and a rather consuming hobby at this point now that I'm retired. So with that as an introduction or by way of apology, I'm ready to start the dog and pony show if you want. And hang on, here we go. I'm gonna talk about IMH, the Institute of Maritime History, who we are, what we do, why we do it. And mostly we do it in the Chesapeake Bay and Potomac River, but we have also run projects over the past 15 or 20 years between uh, Maine and St. Augustine, Florida. So hold on, here we go, if I can find the right button there. If you have trouble reading the text on these slides, please make a comment and we can't do anything about it, but at least we'll know. So who we are, nonprofit founded in 1994. So we've been doing this for what, 26 years and tax exempt. And we do, at least in the Chesapeake area and the part of it that I'm involved with, we don't do archeology, span we do reconnaissance. And when it, the difference is we don't dig, we don't disturb sites. Our motto is no take, no talk. We don't take anything from sites and we don't tell anybody exactly what we found or where it is so that nobody else can go loot historic sites based on our reconnaissance. We only tell the state underwater historic, I'm sorry, the state historic preservation officer in Maryland, that's the state underwater archeologist, Dr. Susan Langley. Uh, we've done some work for the Marine Corps, for the Navy, uh, for the Virginia Department of Historic Resources and some private organizations. Those are the people that we're transparent to, but for the general public, we, in order to protect the sites, we, we keep things kind of close to the vest. And why do we do it? Because somebody has to. The, uh, there are legal requirements on government agencies to manage their historic resource. And that means they know they need to know what they have and where it is, but unfortunately they cannot, they're not funded to go proactive and go out and search. So we do that on a volunteer basis. We also do it for private historical and archeological societies, simply because somebody needs to do it. So there we are, your friendly neighborhood volunteers. This is a list of things that we are not, the things we don't do. And typically, um, we simply do reconnaissance. We'll only do more than a very rough initial assessment if the archaeologist that we're working for wants that, that information. But my understanding is that in most cases, the cultural resources managers and the archaeologists are more concerned with where things are than what they are, because that way they know what areas, geographic areas they have to protect in case somebody wants to work in those areas like building improvements or piers or dredging channels and, and building, uh, building seawalls and jetties. So as, as I said, we are not archeologists. I hope you can read that, but the, the cop in this picture is saying, out of the way, you swine, an archaeologist is coming. And again, we don't dig or disturb or, or tell people where we went. Membership, uh, we are a membership organization. And membership is open to anybody who agrees with our mantra of no take, no talk. But we, that excludes, unfortunately for them, uh, collectors and souvenir hunters. Most of our reconnaissance is done with side scan sonar. With basic uh, side scan sonar programs, you can get the overall measurements of a site 
the length, the breadth, the depth, the orientation. And that's almost enough information to make a, a, say, a state site form report. And then comes the hard part of finding out what it is that we found, figuring out what this anomaly in the bottom is, what ship it was or what ship it might have come from, and when it might have been, uh, been put down there on the bottom of the bay or the bottom of the river. And all this boils down to what we call the four R's, or on Talk Like a Pirate Day, the four R's. And those are recon, record, research, and report to the client agency. Most of our searching is with side scan sonar. And then we have to try to figure out exactly where it is once we have found it. The people we've worked for recently, four federal agencies, three of them within the Department of Defense, eight states, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Maine, Massachusetts, Maryland, uh, New Jersey, and Virginia, and several uh, nonprofit historical or archeological societies. I show five here. And the sixth one was Mount Vernon. We shared costs with them to go look for a miniature ship that was built for a parade in Baltimore in 1787 and then was given to George Washington. And she sank somewhere off Mount Vernon in a hurricane later in 1787. And we spent three summer sessions trying to find her. No such luck. A replica was built in about uh, 1987 and it's on display at BWA Marshall uh, Airport in the passenger terminal on the lower level of the north end. Beautiful little model that was built by um, Alan Rawl, who also built the Kalmar Nickel, the replica tall ship in Wilmington, Delaware. I contacted the people who were involved in designing the uh, replica that Alan built and to ask them if anybody had ever found the original. And they said, no, don't bother looking. It probably drifted down the river in the storm, fetched up on shore and got burned as firewood. But I don't think so. Joshua Barney sailed her single-handed from Baltimore to Mount Vernon to present her to General Washington in June of 1787. There's an entry in his diary, Washington's diary, from the 9th of June that Captain Barney arrived before breakfast and stayed all day and all night. They knew each other from the war. And in fact, Captain Barney was the armed guard in the carriage that took Martha to New York when George was inaugurated. And the, in order to sail that top heavy rig to, from Baltimore to Mount Vernon single-handed, I think she had to be very heavily ballasted. And I suspect that at anchor off Mount Vernon, she was hit by a gust of wind in the hurricane and she just fell over on her side and filled and sank. So she's probably still there under 10 or 20 feet of mud. We just had not been able to find her. And it's one of those sites that we cannot find without disturbing, which leads to a whole series of problems that are beyond our capabilities. Our skiff is the same site as the same size as the ship that we were looking for. Tiny little ship. Most of our work has been done in part of our submerged historical inventory project, one of those cute forced acronyms, SHIP. And we've done it in the Potomac and in the Bay, and um, actually as far away as Europe last year, two years ago. The first project that was still ongoing on a somewhat slow and desultory basis, looking for ships, and we're not sure how many, somewhere between eight and 23, depending on which archive you like, merchant ships that privately owned that were scuttled when Lord Dunmore left St. George's Island on the 1st of August, 1776, Dunmore's floating city. They may have had as many as 120 ships, but when they left, uh, they, they scuttled some that were not fit to go to sea. We've been looking for their remains. 
We have found a few tantalizing hints, but nothing definite yet. This is the area we've been looking around St. George's Island, where the St. Mary's River and the Potomac River meet. And the diving conditions on the bar that extends southeast from the island are superb because you can actually see stuff, unlike much of the Potomac River. But the bottom has been dredged or tonged or raked for oyster. We found a lot of interesting stuff, but nothing that we can date to 1776 yet, but we're still looking. We've, there was a set of electrical wires that we found that may have powered the old lighted buoy, now solar powered, where the um, St. Mary's River and the Potomac join, or it may have, it may relate to the torpedo test range that the Navy had in this area from the 1940s until the mid 1950s. We don't know, and we have not found the ends of those wires. They head from shore, more or less, out to the end of the bar, more or less, but they're buried toward the ends and we haven't disturbed them. We've just simply looked at the visible parts. We've done some work on Civil War wrecks up the Potomac River. This one uh, was really interesting. It's a canal boat that the Confederates scuttled in March of 1862, and the rudder is still on the boat. The deck, if it was decked, is gone but there were two large Dahlgren guns on board, big guns, 11 feet long, 9,200 pounds, muzzle loaders, almost certainly taken from the Portsmouth Navy Yard by the Confederates when they took the Navy Yard. And then they were used uh, as artillery to try to block the Potomac River from ships that were bringing food and fuel and people to Washington because there was only a single track railroad coming into DC from the Northeast. So the city of Washington needed the river. The Confederates tried and failed to blockade it and strangle the city. In the campaign where the Confederates scuttled that canal boat, they also scuttled a steamer named the George Page that had been an Alexandria Georgetown ferry built by and captained by George Page. And she was in Alexandria the night that Virginia seceded. And she was then taken by the Confederates down to Aquia, armed and used as a patrol boat and gunboat in the Potomac until she was scuttled in March of 1862. We took George Page's great, great grandson out to look at the wreck on side scan sonar but unfortunately, the entire wreck is submerged. So we have not been able to, you know, we were not able to get a picture of the wreck in its present condition. But the site is covered with hydrilla in the summertime. And I think Bill Utley in this picture is standing on the deck of the wreck. She was quite shallow. And another Civil War wreck that we have bid to. We don't go on because it's a war grave, is the USS Tulip. We did take uh, Dr. George Schwartz from the Naval Historical and Naval History and Heritage Command. Forgive me, I knew it as the Naval Historical Center, the Underwater Archaeology Branch, and uh, someone from the Supervisor of Salvage and Diving, and two fellows from uh, Phoenix International Holdings, a Soup South contractor out to the site with an ROV and an, under, an autonomous underwater vehicle to take pictures and side scan images of the tulip. She was a small twin screw uh, ship that was built for export to China. The Navy bought her, armed her, and used her as a gunboat in the Potomac. And she had a boiler explosion, which blew out the whole starboard side and killed 47 of her 57 crew. Some of the bodies washed up on the Virginia side, some were recovered, some are buried in Virginia, some are buried at St. Indigo's, and some were never recovered. But we treat the site as a war grave, so we don't touch it. And we don't tell people where it is. This site scan sonar image was taken by the AUV uh, when we were out there with Dr. Schwartz and uh, Phoenix International. 
It shows the whole starboard side is blown away. The ship had two boilers, two engines, and two propellers in a merchant configuration where the boilers and engines were all in the same room. So that damage to that room destroyed her entire engineering plant. A military configuration or naval configuration, they would be in separate compartments with a better chance of surviving damage. The whole starboard side is blown away on the wreck. The black, almost vertical lines are shadows of the frames or ribs sticking up. The whole vessel was 97 feet long and the bow and stern are still recognizable on sonar. Further up the river, there's a whole series of wrecks from the First World War. At least 70 in Mallows Bay, which is now a marine sanctuary. This is an aerial photograph. I'm not sure when it was taken or by whom. The ships are overgrown at this point. Some of them have drifted away. Some have fallen apart and are, are buried. But most of them are still there. And they, it's a NOAA sanctuary. There are kayaking trails through the site. And it's, uh, it's an interesting, rather spooky site. But when the ships that were brought in there, uh, they were brought in from an anchorage across the river at uh, an area off Widewater, Virginia. 15 of them were left at Widewater. Most of those are still there. These are big, big wood ships. The keel structure, the keelson structure, was at least six, in some cases, 10 timbers, each of them 20 by 20. So that's three and a half feet tall and five to seven feet wide, five to 10 feet wide, massive wooden timber, thousands of trees for each of these ships. And about 400, I think, were actually completed. They were built by civilian contractors and the, a man named Ferris, who was the chief naval architect for the Emergency Fleet Corporation, designed one and then the contractors who who undertook to build these things got approval for their own variations on them the main ferris design was huge one of the biggest wooden ships ever built anywhere in the world the only ones i know of that were bigger were built under uh oh what was his name that roman emperor um Caligula. He built two floating pleasure palaces in Lake Nemi that after he was assassinated, the wrecks were allowed to sink. And then in the 1920s and 30s, the Italian government under Mussolini drained the lake using some of the ancient Roman uh, aqueduct system, exposed the wrecks, excavated them, built a museum on shore to preserve these magnificent, massive wooden things and they conserved them according to the best that the government could provide. And then during World War II, the Germans or the Americans, we say they, they say we, burned the museum and destroyed the ships. So it's an interesting example of reasons to leave the ships in C2. They're safer off underwater than they are in a museum. But the Ferris ships and her, their sisters from slightly different designs were about 4,000 tons, about a third of the size of the World War II Liberty ships. This is another Ferris. The ones that are still at wide water are awash at low tide. You can see them on Google Earth. You can go past them and see the, see the hulls or see the turbulence over the hulls by small boat. One of them broke out of the main pack and is against the Virginia shoreline down here. I call that one the outlier. The ones that in the main pack are lying next to or on top of each other. And it's a somewhat dangerous place to dive because it's full of fishing lines. There are snakes, but they tell me that they're water snakes, not cottonmouths, and they're non-poisonous. They look like cottonmouths, but the outlier was a um, different class than the Ferris. What are they? Grays Harbor class. Don Shomet, who is, knows more about these ships than almost anyone, 
um, identified this one as the Aberdeen, which was one of the first of these wooden wood, wooden ships to be delivered by the contractors. And now she serves as a duct blind holder and there's an elm tree growing out of her. Backing up to the duct blind, underneath the middle of the duct blind, there's the stern post of the wreck with a gudgeon, the part of the rudder hinge that is on the stern post, the other part being on the rudder itself. The gudgeon is still there and still visible. This one, which I think came from Widewater, not from Mallows Bay, fetched up on the beach down at, uh, oh, what's the name of it? Caledon State Park on the Virginia side, almost to Matthias Neck. And the row of spikes and the timber that you see running down the center is not the Kilson. That's under the driftwood. That's a stringer alongside running parallel to the Kielsen. This other wreck that drifted half a mile south from Widewater in Tropical Storm Ernesto shows that sort of stringer more clearly. There's the Kielsen, uh, 60 or 120 inches wide. The pointy end in the lower left of the corner is the back pointy end. That's the stern of the ship. Underwater, the stern is just as pointy as the bow. Sam Glover and Greg Jolly of IMH walked around in the engine room and, and took measurements that were enough to confirm that this is one of the Ferris class. That was the only one that we knew of that had five layers of timber or five timbers across and down the center of the engine room. The structure that they're standing on is too far away from the Kilson to be that stringer. So I'm guessing that this was one of the very few of the twin engine, twin screw Ferris class. And there was only one of those that was known to be left at uh, uh, at Widewater, the SS Okaya. So uh, I'm betting a dollar that this is the Okaya wreck. When we were out there, um, I got a telephone call on cell from a delightful lady who lives on shore and she saw us on the, on the site and she tracked us down on the internet and found my phone number and called to say, what are you people doing on my wreck? She took an ownership interest in it and kept an eye on it and God bless her. The wrecks, at least this one, have diagonal steel straps to reinforce the planking on the outside of the hull. They found out the hard way that the ships needed those kinds of steel straps. Two of these ships foundered in ballast, meaning no cargo, just empty, in a storm on their maiden voyage off Baja, California. And someone decided intelligently that maybe if we put steel straps to hold the planking together, they might live longer. The thought was in building these things that if they can actually carry one cargo, they've made their They've made their money, they've earned their keep. Hundreds of them were built. And I think a few of them actually did carry cargo. Most of them were scrapped, never having done anything useful. One was burned and sunk off New Jersey in a grade B movie called The Halfway Girl. And some were converted to sale, but most of them ended up on the scrap heap. We have a lot of other sites that uh, we need to work in the Potomac. These are, are some of them. We don't know what they are, except the bottom one, which I'm pretty sure is a railroad barge that was built in Kingston, New York, and foundered off St. Clement's Island, or Blackstone Island, it was also called, in 1940. And we found her 20 miles downriver off the mouth of the St. Mary's River. She must have drifted along, but she exactly fits the enrollment, the, uh, the registration for the ship in terms of her dimensions. And this vessel was obviously 20th century, linoleum on the decks, some uh, ceramic tiles in the area that was probably the head. And the tiles were made by the Wenzel Tile Company that was started in 1905 and went out of business in the 1980s. 
and electrical wiring and light bulbs on the wreck. So 20th century. That's about it for the Potomac. We have many, many ships to, or many wrecks to look for in the Chesapeake. We have found a couple of hundred. We've reported 102 so far. Various archives that we've looked at come up with a, a rough estimate of 2,277. So we have found less than 1%, maybe a half a percent. We got a lot of work to do. The one that started all this is the Herbert D. Maxwell, which was built in Bath, Maine in 1905 and was run down by a steamer a month before the Titanic. And it's a beautiful wreck. It lies about four miles below the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. In her prime and 12 years later on side scan sonar, I had dived on the wrecks a few times and actually got through the hatches down inside the hold before I we took the or somebody took the side scan and we saw that there are beams in those hatches. We were able to I was able to get down the hatch without knowing that there were beams. Stay away from the stern because it's a real jumble back there of broken timbers where the steamer ran her down. I am told that the captain of the ship was at the wheel in the collision and the after house with the captain's wife was knocked off in the collision and drifted down the bay. She got on top of the house and the house fetched up on the shoreline down around Calvert Cliffs and she was wet and angry and cold but survived. The captain's brother and three or four other men were in the forward house when the schooner sank and they died. The house is no longer there, but some of the machinery that was in the house, uh, including the donkey boiler that provided steam for the deck machinery, not for propulsion, but for the windlasses and the winches, which is why she was called a steam schooner. The propulsion was sail, but she did have steam for deck machinery. Uh, the boiler is still there. The windlass is still there. At least they were the last time I dived on it, which was some time ago. In this side scan picture, the black area is the shadow and the stripes back aft in the black area are the shadows of the deck beams where the steamer hit her. Sometimes the shadow, and you'll see this in future uh, side scans, the shadow gives you as much information as the actual image. This is another wreck we've been working rather actively. Don't know who she is, heart of a ship. It looks as though she was cut in half by a collision but we don't know for sure. One that fits the description was a, a small screw steamer as opposed to a paddle wheel named the Curlew. It was sometimes chartered by the army during the Civil War, but she was privately owned and she was in her private owner's hands when she was sunk in November of 1863. She may not be the Curlew, she may be one of the others. There is a lot of unidentified and unreported wrecks out there. This is a side scan image of the same type taken with a much more expensive unit than we have. The one, the first one in color was with a $2,500 unit that we have. The other one, the beautiful black and white image with great detail and high resolution, a quarter of a million dollars. But the $2,500 unit is a lot better than the one we started with, a stick. Actually, our initial search technique was to drop a mushroom anchor with a 50 pound line on it with five foot intervals on the line and then do a five foot circle, a 10 foot circle, a 15 foot circle until we either found something or ran out of air or got bored. We did a lot of diving and we didn't find very much. The $2,500 side scan has been a tremendous investment. The wreck has what I think is a boiler and the top of it is covered by what I think are cut off and rolled up tubes that probably were the remains of a superheater that was deactivated. And rather than rebuild the top of the boiler, they just stopped the tubes. That's my guess of what this field of things that look like stuffed grape leaves at a Greek restaurant are. That boiler has a gauge on it that is cracked and full of mud. The crack might indicate that the machinery was hot when she sank 
and the glass cracked from thermal expansion or whatever the opposite of expansion is. The numbers on the top read 120, 130, 140, which is probably too high for a pressure for a steam engine from the 1860s. So this might be a, a thermometer. In order to know for sure, we would have to remove it and dismantle it and conserve it. And we don't do that sort of thing. If anybody wants to do that under permit from the state of Maryland, that would be fine. We take them out there to do it. But uh, that's the sort of disturbance that we do not do. And there's this thing lying alongside the boiler that is about the size of a scuba tank, but it's riveted together and it's made out of copper or bronze. Probably an air flask, but we don't know for sure. These sorts of details of the machinery would help us if we can find remain records of these things in the archives. It would help us identify the wreck. And that's where sort of the research of those four R's comes in. We found a, a rather bizarre anchor of a, an experimental type that was used and, and then abandoned, but the Titanic carried two because of the Board of Trade uh, told them to. We saw it on side scan sonar, we dived on it, and we couldn't figure out what it was right away. It took 12 dives to figure it out, <clears throat> excuse me, because we'd never seen one like it before. It took a lot of measurements, and then we found the chain and the stud link on this kind of chain. Uh, it, this kind of chain is only used really for, for anchor chain. So that means that these pictures are some sort of an anchor, and we found online a picture of one at the Mariners Museum in Newport News. Turns out they have two. We were able to get measurements of the flukes and the palms, but not of the whole length of it. So we're not quite sure how long it was and how, therefore how heavy it was. The Mariners Museum has two of about the same size. They don't know exactly how much they weigh either but they've got to be in the two to three ton range. Big hooks. We also found a propeller about 10 feet in diameter. Rounded tips, the blades are bolted to the hub instead of cast. And about 10 feet in diameter. This is one of the uh, sketches by the divers on the site. Propellers on the Titanic were somewhat bigger, but of a very similar configuration. Don't know because of the uh, covers on the hubs, whether these blades are bolted on or the entire massive propeller was cast in one piece. Very difficult casting. The, uh, as we said, 2,277 wrecks in the bay, more or less. We've only found a few. We've got a lot more work to do. And we've got a lot of sites that we have found on SideScan that we need to identify that's one, this one might be the schooner Tuckahoe, founded in 1949, is that? It was built in 1914 at Baltimore. 1914, 1918, 1918. This one, no clue. This one, maybe. The steamship Louisiana, which happened to be the steamer that hit the curlew. It might be another schooner that sank two weeks after the Louisiana, again, collisions. Or it might be another one that we, uh, we don't know. All we know on this one is the very rough dimensions of the timbers, the location where she lies, not where she sank, and what we have in the archives of vessels that were known to have been lost in that general area. It's a big guess. This one is kind of interesting. The wreck is not really that wavy. The helmsman was. The side scan images are taken over a period of time. And if the boat does not hold a straight course, the wreck looks wavy. Four hatches or maybe three hatches and an engine room. We don't know if it was a ship 
with the engine back aft and the house back aft that's since been knocked off or a barge. We don't have dimensions on this one yet. It'll take a, just a couple of dives to get basic information. This one and here is one of those side scan images where the shadow is informative because you can see the raised bow. Noah identifies her as a Menhaden trawler, but we don't know which one or when she sank. This one might be the five-masted schooner Bright that was anchored off the mouth of the Choptank River. And was while she was at anchor, she was run down by a steamer. And uh, it went into litigation. The case was decided by the federal court in Baltimore. This was, I don't have a picture of the Bright, but this was a typical five-master of those days. This may be one of those wooden steamers from World War I because some of them were converted to large schooners of four or five masts. There's some Navy ships in the bay, a battleship, at least two submarines and a German U-boat. And I'm told that submarines were on our side and they were innovative and gallant, but the Germans had U-boats that were sneaky and evil. This particular U-boat surrendered at the end of the war the British played with her for a year, gave her to us. We played with her for a year. I'll get into that. But uh, she is sunk in the Potomac River now, sunk after the war. A battleship and a couple of submarines. The battleship Texas, which was um, built in the 1890s and participated in the Spanish-American War, traded shots with the Spanish uh, off Santiago de Cuba in 1898. And then in 1912, she was sunk as a gunnery target off Tangier Island in the Chesapeake. After this picture was taken, the wreck was cleared for navigation. It's entirely submerged now. She did take some hits from the Spanish uh, at Santiago. One of the submarines, the S-49, was sold in the 1930s and the private owners instead of scrapping her took her on tour around the great lakes and you could pay money to go on board and tour a submarine and then during the war the navy bought her back because she was still more or less intact they did not recommission her uh, they used her as a training aid for salvage training some of the s-class submarines were used early in the war and they were not used very well. Uh, they, they were not very good ships. Boats, excuse me, all submarines are boats regardless of size. This is a picture of her under private ownership when her name was changed to the letter C and her torpedo tubes forward had been plated over and painted over as part of the demilitarization. And this is how she looks on side scan sonar now in the Patuxent River and another side scan image. The, uh, the Navy cut away one side of her conning tower, but the other side of it still stands. It's not a pleasant dive. She's in 133 feet of water and she stands proud. Thanks to the current, the mud that would otherwise be around the wreck has been scoured away and she stands on hard uh, bedrock at the bottom of the river. But she stands proud, and if you like deep, dark diving when in strong current, uh, she's up for grabs. Don't take anything from her. I'm not up for grabs that way. She's still Navy property. The Dragonette uh, was built late in World War II. She made a couple of war patrols, did not fire any shots in anger, ran aground, sustained damage on her first patrol, did rescue several downed Naval aviators, and then she went into the reserve fleet after the war. She was reactivated and steamed, no, it was towed from the West Coast through the Panama Canal to the Chesapeake Bay and expended as an explosive test target in, uh, in the second deepest hole in the Chesapeake. It's a slightly deeper one off Kent Island, but she's in about 150 feet of water across the bay from the Patuxent River. The U-boat that I mentioned uh, sunk in 1949 in a weapon test. 
on the 19th of September, which is an easy date for me to remember because it's Dr. Susan Langley's birthday, and it's also Talk Like a Pirate Day. So we, we try to dive the U-boat on the 19th. We service the mooring buoy. The, it's a public site as an historic shipwreck reserve, but it's still owned by the Navy, managed by the Maryland Historical Trust, and IMH does the grunt work of servicing the buoy and diving on the wreck to clear fishing lines and other debris off the wreck. Only one of her sister Type 7 C-41s still exists. This one is a museum ship in La Boe, Germany, which was part of East Germany. Uh, after the war, she was taken by the Norwegian Navy, and they used her for a number of years and did not do any serious modifications. <laughs> and then she was given back to Germany and now is a museum. The U-boat is not a fun dive. This, the conning tower and the Wintergarten, the deck area, the raised deck after the conning tower where the anti-aircraft guns were located, they stand proud of the mud. Most of the main deck in the bow and the stern are covered by mud. The propellers, if they're still on there, have been diving this wreck since about 1985. I don't know if the props are on her or not. They are buried 20 feet under the mud. But the conning tower is kind of fun to dive. Sometimes the visibility is really good, like six feet. Sometimes it's about six microns. It mostly depends on how strong the current is running and how much rain we've had. Because when we've had a dry spell for a while, the river clears up. But rain brings mud that kills visibility. So those are the Navy wrecks we've dived, and there are some Navy airplanes out in the bay. Uh, one in particular that is almost certainly a World War II fighter plane, the F-8F Bearcat. It was a very hot little aircraft that never actually saw combat during the war. It came on the scene too late, but it did see action in uh, Vietnam in French Indochina, I think in Korea. And it was the first aircraft, first type of aircraft that the Blue Angels flew. It was small, about the size of a P-39 Aero Cobra with a massive 2000 plus horsepower radial engine. Very fast, very light, very maneuverable. The thinking was that the longer range Navy fighters, the F-4U Corsair and the F-6F Hellcat would do the long range work in the Pacific War. And the F-8Fs would stay close to the task force and be combat air patrol to intercept and shoot down kamikazes. That was the thinking. This one in the bay was one of the early prototypes that had frangible wing tips that to save a few pounds of weight, the wing tips would break off when they aircraft went into a high G maneuver. And if one of the wingtips broke off and the other one didn't, so you had asymmetrical lift, there were explosive bolts to blow the other one off. And the explosive bolts were found to be rather dangerous every once in a while when they were servicing the aircraft, something would go wrong and one of the explosive bolts would kill one of the uh, aircraftmen. So later versions of the F-8F got away from that and they gained a few pounds of weight, but saved a, a bunch of friendly lives. Picture of the cockpit new and a picture of the cockpit that our diver Fred Engel took. I don't know whether this indicates that somebody ripped the instrument panel out of it or not. We did not penetrate, we do not penetrate, we will not penetrate into the cockpit because it may be a war grave. The Navy found a few pieces floating from the aircraft after she crashed. They did not find the aircraft herself and they did not find the pilot. So he is missing and presumed dead. But there is a chance that his remains will still be in the, in the cockpit. So we don't penetrate, we don't disturb. This is another aircraft we have no idea. Well, sorry, this one, we have an idea who she is. 
This one, we don't know yet. This is how it looks on a multi-beam sonar. And this is how it looks on our side scan sonar. This is a couple of images stitched together. And it's going to take a lot of dives to figure out which one this is. Very heavy aluminum structure and very badly mangled. So that is consistent with a Navy aircraft that hit the water at high speed. But we don't know which aircraft it lies just outside the uh, a target area and is probably a Navy aircraft. But we don't know. Speaking of aircraft, uh, the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, which used to be called the Joint POW Accounting Command, JPAC, uh, DPAA now sent us through a subcontractor over to Germany to look at the remains of a B-17, where some of the aircrew are still missing in action. Found the aircraft and that was our limit on the project. It was a B-17 that blew up in the air and fell into the water. This is not that particular one, but it's just here to give you an example of the sort of devastation that comes from a, a bomber that blows up in the air. I don't know whether this aircraft exploded with her bomb load or not. Our aircraft had dropped her bombs and she was empty when she exploded. The uh, Luftwaffe pilot who shot her down uh, was shot down later that mission. He was wounded and that was his last sortie. He survived the war and was interviewed afterwards and described the shoot down. We may have a project in Panama to look at Rex off Nombre de Dios, which was the first Spanish port on the north side of Panama, the Caribbean side, when the silver from the mines in Peru was brought across the isthmus by mule train and loaded onto ships that would then go back to Havana and eventually back to Spain. At least four Spanish ships in the late 16th, late 16th, early 16th century are, are known to be there. We might be able to find one. This is an engraving of what Nombre de Dios looked like when in her heyday. And this is a photo of what the area looks like now. The area is populated by descendants of black slaves of the Spanish who escaped and settled in, in this area and fought a persistent guerrilla warfare against the Spanish for a very long time until finally in the peace treaty, each side agreed to, you stay on your side, we stay on our side, and their descendants are still there. The area is economically depressed and our project, if we get the reconnaissance project, would be part of a much larger project to try to help the area economically. Other than the ship project, we have training. We sometimes have a field school but most of our training is done on the job. It takes a lot of practice to get productive and useful in the kind of diving we do. Not that it's that difficult, but it takes a whole different series of skills. These guys are mapping a, a site in the dry. This one is in Maine. And this is the sort of map that they came up with. Now do this blindfolded in cold or wet water while you're worried about holding on, but without holding on, maintaining your position without touching and damaging the wreck. Uh, and worried about other things like Vibrio, flesh-eating bacteria that likes brackish water, warm brackish water like Chesapeake Bay in the summertime. Um, while we're doing that, we also help the Maryland Dove most recently, I think two weekends ago, and we've got another dive coming up in a couple of weeks. We go under her to clean her propellers with a putty knife. I'm sorry to say this, but this replica 17th century ship has twin diesels and variable pitch propellers. Not an exact replica. The Coast Guard wouldn't allow that. We also spent some time laying oyster reef balls 
in the St. Mary's River for the uh, St. Mary's River Watershed Association right off the college. And the St. Augustine Lighthouse Museum borrowed our boat for nine summer seasons, including one where they raised two cannons off a wreck. This is a long four pounder. They also raised a nine pound carronade, which is sort of the maritime version of a shotgun. It's a short, light weapon that fires a very heavy shell uh, at a fairly short range. This four pound, the four pounder and the nine pounder were both conserved and they're on display at the museum. And despite my no take, no talk, these guys are professional archeologists and they did have permits from Florida and they knew what they were doing, but they just happened to use our boat in the process. There are a couple of World War, I'm sorry, Revolutionary War wrecks off Philadelphia that we went looking for. We found a few, but not the one that we were looking for. And we went looking for a steamer from just after the Civil War in Georgia. Uh, we did not need the side scan sonar for that one. All we needed was a metal probe. The steamer was burned deliberately uh, because the freed slaves on the island where the steamer was were told that the army was there to capture the former slaves and sell them back into slavery in Jamaica or Trinidad. And they burned the steamer so that that could not happen. In the revolution and the War of 1812, the British under Lord Dunmore in the revolution and again under Admiral Coburn uh, in the War of 1812, Slaves were told that the British would give them their freedom if they would fight on the British side. And I don't know about the War of 1812, but in the Revolution, the Brits reneged. And some of those slaves who had fought for the British were sold back into slavery in the Caribbean. So the story that the ones on this island in Georgia were told was credible historically. We didn't find the steamer, but the alligators found us. And they didn't bother us, but they came around to see what we were doing. We don't have that kind of problem here in the Chesapeake. We do dive in the wintertime. Carolyn McManus and Dave Panzer diving on the U-boat in January of 2020. Water temperature was a balmy 42, I think. Dry suit diving. Our diving safety officer spends too much time in the water. He really is our diving safety officer. Now, these guys, these are just pictures I found on the internet of divers who were following the proper archaeological diving protocol, feet up, not manhandling the wreck, not dragging things through the wreck, not finning the wreck and disturbing the small stuff with their scuba fins, diving very carefully and hovering above the wreck. This guy is doing it with fins, but again, the right form. It's hard to do that when you're diving in a full face mask, you know, one of these things, where when you go face down, the mask floods. So you're looking through water and you need to turn your mask up to purge it, blow the water out of your mask. And also when you're diving in a dry suit, one thing you don't want to do is go feet up because then the air that's in your dry suit will go into your feet and you'll tend to float upside down, which is somewhat awkward. Um, this mask, which is brand new, just got it today, is for a scuba regulator that fits through there and it's good for cold weather, cold water. The full face masks that we're starting to use now, uh, you breathe normally without a regulator in your mouth and the air comes down and defrosts the inside of the, the vision or the mask so that you don't have to uh, flood the mask to clean it and then purge the, the water out of the mask. But again, the same problem with trying to do this <coughs> face down. They are not absolutely waterproof. You will get water in there. But with those, but that is background. Our priorities are don't get hurt, 
don't hurt the wreck. And if you're not going to get good data, the dive is wasted. The time is wasted. The fuel to get to the dive and the gas you breathe are wasted. So get good data. In order to do that, you need to be a fully qualified IMH diver. And in order to do that, you need to get a basic diving certification, advanced open water, which is the second step for PADI. And other skills or specialties that the diving agencies can give you that are handy are night diving. And the diving we do in zero vis or low vis is night diving any time of day. Solo diving, you may be diving with a buddy on our dives, but your buddy may not be able to find you if you get into trouble. And your buddy certainly can't breathe for you and can't decide for you. So you're basically on your own and you need to be comfortable with that. Wreck diving is good, but we're not, we are diving on wrecks, but we're not wreck diving in the normal dive training sense. We're there to look and not to take, not to touch and only leave bubbles and only take pictures and measurements. Navigation is a big help because you really got to know where you are and you need to be able to navigate by braille, which means you need to become familiar with the wreck without hurting it. Buoyancy, usually neutral. If you're going to be working one specific site, it's good to dive about 10 pounds heavy so you stay there without fighting or fitting the site to stay there. Uh, gas, either air or nitrox is the diver's option. Air is, most of us use air. Many of us use nitrox, which is a lot more expensive than air, but it does give you more dive time at shallower depths. Gear, uh, keep it simple. Carry what you need. Not like this. Uh, a measuring tape, a slate to record your measurements on, a camera. Uh, two lights, because one might fail, a John line, as it's called, a about a six foot long line with knots every foot to help you measure things. But if you do come up on the ascent line, uh, you might want the John line to clip off and maintain your depth without holding on to the John line itself to make room for other divers on the uh, on the descent line. So John lines are handy. And also you can use them to do a very small radius uh, circle search. Oops. Other necessary skills, buoyancy and trim, face down, feet up. Recognizing vessel components. It's all very interesting to come back and say, I found a pointy thing that's oh, about as big as a loaf of bread or a bread box. Uh, I don't know what it is. It really helps if you can recognize things, which means you have to know something about naval architecture of the period of the wreck that you're looking at. You also have to be able to measure and record your measurements to be able to map the wreck, which is to translate your, or to transfer the data that you got on the dive into something legible right after the dive before you forget all the details. It helps to photograph uh, it's really nice to photograph with a scale or something that we can use as a scale in the photograph so we know how big that thingy that you found really is. Again, navigating by Braille or by the current or by features. When I say navigating by current, when you first get down on the site, take a few seconds, stay still, and see which way the current is moving and know in advance uh, about what time you can expect the current will change. Almost all of our diving is in tidal water, even in the river. And interestingly, in the Potomac, the, the flood current is always stronger than the ebb current. You would expect the ebb to be stronger, but it's not. Uh, we need to deploy surface marker buoys. If you don't know how to do that, uh, it's, it's an acquired skill. Usually we communicate by touch or line poles hand squeezes, that sort of thing, which you don't need to do if you're diving in a dry suit with comms, with underwater hypersonic communications, not quite radio frequency, but uh, the comms themselves are another acquired skill. You can't exhale while you're speaking because the noise of your breath will drown out your voice on the microphone. 
We also want all our divers to be qualified and certified in first aid, O2 provider, CPR, and carry DAN insurance. For those of you who are not divers, DAN is the Divers Alert Network, and they provide uh, diving insurance that covers recompression therapy. Touch wood, we have never had an injury on a site. We did have one diver a few years ago come down with a Vibrio infection. If you're not familiar with Vibrio, it's a flesh-eating bacteria that likes warm, brackish water. It's treatable, but you have to treat it early on. He was smart enough to recognize that there's something wrong, former Navy corpsman, and he got checked out and he was inpatient on IV antibiotics for a few days. And no, no residual problem, but um, many people get seriously hurt by Vibrio infections. It's a nasty bug. And the Chesapeake in summer has it. Uh, and for those of you who don't dive or don't want to dive in this muck that we usually dive in, or don't want to dive in the wintertime, there are a lot of other things that you could do, like drive the boat, help maintain and fix the boat. Um, Plot and interpret the sonar data and the magnetometer data. Magging is a black art. Sonar is difficult enough. Uh, run the computers, manage the database that we maintain with uh, about 5,000 wrecks in the Chesapeake. And we've got about 25,000 on the database east of the Rocky Mountains. And they all need work. Mapping what we have found, uh, it'd be really nice if somebody understood GIS, knew how to fly drones and had access to LIDAR. That would be cool. Uh, people who like to do archival and online research, we need to spend just as much time diving in the archives as we do diving on sites. It'd be really nice if somebody uh, could do development, fundraising, recruiting, outreach, public relations, uh, photo and video, um, and help write reports and help write grant applications and make much better PowerPoints than this, which I cobble together and apologies. Thank you for your patience in watching this. Our plans for this year, back to the U-boat, of course, uh, practice site mapping in dry suits and full face masks in that awkward mask flooding position. We've got a bunch more sites in the Bay and Potomac that I would really like to work and we want more data on 17 sites that we've already reported. Legend has it that one of the guns from the Ark that brought the first settlers in Maryland here in 1634, one of her guns is still in the river uh, where there used to be a fort. There's one in front of the courthouse in downtown Leonardtown, and there are others scattered around, but, uh, the Navy wants to look for this one. We may go out there this, this summer. And uh, other plans are to do whatever else the Navy or Maryland Historical Trust or DPAA want us to do. We are at their beck and call. A quick recap, we're a volunteer organization, the four R's. No take, no talk. There's a lot of different skills uh, that we need and a lot of different sites to dive on here throughout the US East Coast, we don't work the West Coast. And one of the reasons for that is that a lot of wrecks in California that would love to work, but the state of California under state law will disclose information under their uh, version of the Freedom of Information Act. They'll disclose the nature and location of wrecks. Maryland doesn't have to do that. And so, We'll report everything to Maryland, but there's no point in giving the information to people who might loot or giving the information to somebody who will give the information to people who might loot. So although I lived in California for a while and I love the state, we're not gonna dive there. If you would like to get involved in this consuming hobby, join IMH, obviously pay dues. Um, Things that you need to know, diving, only if you're going to dive. Archaeology, yes. Maritime history and naval architecture and mapping and drawing, yes, because we need to translate diver data into something that's at least intelligible for 
legible to somebody who knows what they're looking at. This, these skills take time for training, field work, and research. Um, if you're going to dive, you need your own gear. We have some, we're gladly loan out, but you really need to get and maintain your own so that you trust it and so that you know its peculiarities. And chip in. Projects cost money. Projects cost a lot of money, but we're a 501c3, so anything that you spend on our behalf or for our projects is tax deductible if you itemize. Thanks for listening. Kudos to the Maryland Historical Trust, especially uh, Susan Langley, Troy Novak, and Jenny Cosham, the Naval History and Heritage Command, especially Dr. George Schwartz, the uh, Naval Facilities Engineering Command, Dr. Mike Smolak used to be the man there, and now it's Craig Lukasik, who's an old friend from Delaware. Uh, John Haynes is no longer at the Marine Base Quantico, but he was of great assistance to us in the projects we did there. Special thanks to uh, Captain Paul Lenhar at Southern Maryland Divers, a dive shop that we could not live without, and the many members and friends of IMH. Thank you all. <laughs> Bye. Ah, so not don't go anywhere yet. Now, if we don't have the same audio problems we had earlier, I know there are some questions that were in the chat room. And if anybody had one they hadn't asked yet, you are more than welcome. But um, Dave, there are a couple of questions we had. And one person in one of those particularly uh, mucky slides where it just was just so difficult to see. They said, how is it possible to ever identify an old wreck when there's so much mud, so little visibility, and you can't disturb it? I mean, especially you talked about these ones that had no idea what they were. It's uh, said to be a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle with most of the pieces mixing and missing and no picture on the box, blindfold. So it's it's fun. It's a challenge. Absolutely. How, how many wrecks do you know of that are out uh, here close by or in the Chesapeake that you've seen during the War of 1812? That was another question. Uh, War of 1812 wrecks. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, there are, when the British... The Brits, the British, the Royal Navy dropped the British Army up the Patuxen River, uh, someplace around Benedict, God's grace. The Army marched overland, um, brought the Americans aside at Bladensburg, what became known as the Bladensburg Races, came into Washington, uh, set fire to the White House and the, a bunch of government buildings. The Royal Navy then came up the Potomac River to fetch the British Army. And they were late. The army decided not to wait. They walked out. The Royal Navy put the city of Alexandria under contribution. That is, if you pay us enough money, we won't burn your city. I don't remember what the, the uh, amount of money was. And the Royal Navy took about 23 merchant vessels as prize. There's a difference between prize and capture. You capture an enemy warship, you take a merchant vessel as prize, and you don't, you, a, a, a Navy, don't get title to the prize until a, an admiralty court approves the taking and the, somebody puts a value on it. Uh, so the Royal Navy took these prizes down the river and they were held up at what is now uh, Fort Belvoir, just below the next promontory below Mount Vernon by army guns and Navy gunners up on the bluffs of uh, Belvoir Plantation in those days, now Fort Belvoir. There are some wrecks and the whole area, of the mud flats across the river from Belvoir must be full of cannonballs that were fired at the Brits. They held the Brits up for about 24 hours until the Brits realized that if we shift ballast to the port side, we can tilt the ship a little bit, get some extra elevation on our guns and actually shoot at those troublesome Yankees up on the bluff. And at that point, the American forces thought, oh, we're out of ammunition, we're, it's time to leave. And so the Brits, after that delay, sailed past and sailed down the river with all 23 
prizes in tow or under sale. I believe that a few of those prizes were remain in the river. So that those would be War of 1812. All this was going on actually in the summer of 1814. Other than that, I don't know of any 1812 wrecks in the bay. Probably are some up around uh, Baltimore, but we haven't dived up there yet. We haven't even scanned up there. So, sorry. Interesting. Well, there was another question. You mentioned information gathered from archives. What are the archives and are, are there more than one source and are they open to the public? They are open to the public. Well, they were open to the public. I don't know if they are now with this COVID business. Um, they're mostly in the uh, federal archives in Beltsville. And for 19th century vessels, there's a document called an enrollment for merchant vessels in U.S. coastal trade. And it, like the that Alexander Georgetown ferry, the George Page, her dimensions. It gives uh, information on her structure. Uh, it gives all sorts of useful stuff that you wouldn't get otherwise. There are secondary sources. Uh, there are a lot of fascinating books published about shipwrecks on the Chesapeake Bay and steamships. Some of them have good tactical information like dimensions of the hull and the engines, the type of engines. There are a lot of different types of steam engines. Um, some of the books have good histories of ships and the, the way the ships were lost and the people who were lost with the wrecks in some cases. One of the projects that we might undertake in this, this year is to see if the if some of the anomalies that we have found on sonar might come from a steamer named Express, which was a paddle wheeler that was built, I believe in the 1840s, was extended twice, cut it in the middle and pad her out, lengthened twice. And then in October of 1878, she fell apart in a storm on the east side of the bay with a great loss of life. And some of the crew, and I think one or two of the passengers survived and were, were rescued by another ship, which then ran aground, but survived the storm. So I think out of 22 crew and nine passengers, I think 18 died. I'm not sure of the numbers. But um, in our friend Don Shomet's book, Ch uh, Shipwrecks on the Chesapeake, 1984, I think, um, he gives a very vivid account of, of the sinking and the loss of, of that particular ship. I say our friend because Don is an old friend and came to Texas with me when we bought Roper in 1999, 12 days underway to bring her from basically Texas, just up between Galveston and Houston, across the Gulf of Mexico, across Florida, through Lake Okeechobee, outside at Port Canaveral, caught the Gulf Stream, came back in at Moorhead City and up the intracoastal waterway in the bay from there. 12 days with three grumpy old men and a little tin boat and we're friends. We love John Shomet. He has done speaker series for us before and he is fabulous. I completely agree with you. He's wonderful. Um, somebody had asked, what if a wreck drifts into the sea lanes? What happens then? Sometimes uh, it gets hit. Sometimes it sinks later. Uh, sometimes it falls apart. There's so many variables, it's hard to predict. Under the what's generally called the Wreck Act, the River and Harbors Appropriations Act of 1899, as amended, sorry, law had on there for a moment. Um, the owner of a wreck, if it becomes a hazard to navigation, if it sinks and becomes a hazard to navigation, is obligated to mark it with a beacon by day and a lighted lantern by night and to maintain those marks until the wreck is abandoned legally or uh, is removed. And if the owner won't do that, the government has the right to do it and charge the owner the expense of having the Coast Guard put a beacon or a, a light aid to navigation on it and maintain it until the owner abandons the wreck. 
but the government will not accept abandonment anymore. So if your boat sinks and is a hazard of navigation, you got to remove it. Oh dear. It's not necessarily where you think it is. That wreck that I uh, think of the Elise Sea, that railroad barge that sank off St. Uh, Clements Island, 20 miles downstream from where she was reported to have sunk. They move a wooden wreck. The wrecks at, at uh, Widewater, one of them, the one with that, that picture of her on the surface with a pointy end in the lower left hand corner, that moved a half a mile down the river in Tropical Storm Ernesto. Six tenths of a mile, actually. Wow. It's 300 feet long and 42 feet wide, and it's wood. It's a big raft. Waterlogged, but not very heavy. The actual ground effect, as it's called in salvage, the amount of weight that the wreck is exerting on the riverbed is only 100 pounds, maybe 1,000 at the most. Uh, they're very light, comparatively, unless they have steel hulls or unless the machinery, the engines, the, the boilers, coal, that sort of stuff. If that's still in the wreck, then it'll stay put. But if it's a wooden wreck, it's just a bundle of sticks. It's going to float around until it falls apart or it's so waterlogged that there's it's slightly negative and then it'll sink. But if the current is strong enough, it'll still move. Good grief. I had no idea they could move that much. Somebody else, else had asked about the diving conditions and they said, what kind of special equipment are you using beyond sonar just for basic diving needs? I mean, it was just unbelievably dense to try to see through. It's, it's murky. The people who dived on that aircraft in Europe uh, said the top couple of feet were like diving in soup and then a meter or two or three down, it was like diving in pudding. And then when they got down where the wreckage was, it was like diving in wet cement. So this is an acquired taste. <laughs> Obviously so. If, if people learn how to dive down in the Caribbean, they're not going to enjoy this. My first dives were in murky water in the Philippines it, when I was even younger and dumber. Um, I trained in New York City. My first dives were right off Coney Island, um, Breezy Point, Coney Island, and not all that far from the harbor discharge of New York back in the 1980s before um, there was much in the way of sewage treatment. So it was not the most pleasant diving in the world. Uh, so the Chesapeake to me is great. I like diving in the Delaware River because it makes the Chesapeake look good by comparison. It is black. It is black. Um, we lost some equipment in the Delaware River. On my third dive, I found it and recovered it. I never saw it until we reached the surface. Um, um, I did have another question. One, uh, he was wondering if any Bayline steamers uh, have ever been found. Are you familiar with Bayline steamers? The old Bayline. Um, there is one. The Express was that we there that we're looking for. Uh, I don't remember which line she was. I don't know if it was the old Bayline or not. There's another one named BS Ford that was taken out of service, converted to a barge. I think we know where her wreck is. We have not identified any for sure yet. Um, and somebody asked, how many divers total do you have working with you right now? Actively, about a dozen. Uh, members of the Institute who are around and, and we converse uh, about 40 or 50, I think. I have found over the years that if I talk to a thousand people, a hundred will be very interested. 10 of those will actually come out and dive once. One of them will come back. So it's, it's a very low rate of return. Who come back are usually not those who live or those who learned and started diving in the Caribbean. I tell, very I tell sport divers and, and pretty fish divers, go to Cozumel go to Saba, go to the Red Sea, go to uh, Bali, stay out of my river. <laughs> you're, not, you're not going to enjoy it. And 
again, no take, no talk. We don't want a whole lot of people diving on wrecks that are that are f fragile and sensitive if they're war graves, and very delicate. Um, you know, we don't want, we won't, don't want our diving to lead to either looting or inadvertent or advertent destruction. And inadvertent destruction is just as common. People who mean well, but they really don't have the skills and they don't have the, the caution to dive on an historic wreck without hurting it. So it's, it's better for the wreck to stay off it. So I saw one, uh, one I know we have time for one more, and they'd ask, well, what about Barney's ship in the Patuxent? The Navy uh, has the oar on that. They, what, do you mean the little one, the, fe the little Federalist in um, Washington, or Barney's flotilla up the Patuxent? That not clear which question. They just said, how about Barney's ship on the Patuxent? So I'm not sure. There's a group of, of uh, row galleys that were under the command of Captain Barney in 1814. They were chased. They were on their way down to attack the British fort and training base on Tangier Island. And they were caught out on the bay and chased up the Patuxent River. And they withstood a, an attack by British small boats. And then they counterattacked and the Brits retreated. And the Americans, instead of chasing the Brits, went up the Patuxent River and Barney and most of the flotilla men um, left the boats there and marched overland, caught up with the American army at Bladensburg. And then they also manned some of the forts at Baltimore and during the Rockets Ray Glare and all that, um, leaving the fleet behind uh, or the flotilla behind with instructions to, I think it was Barney's sons, who stayed with the with the flotilla? If the British show up, burn the fleet, and they did, and they did, and they're still there. The Navy and Naval Historical Center has been uh, working on them. Some of the material from those sites was brought up in the 1980s and is at the Calvert Marine Museum on loan from the Navy. But the Navy sites, so we don't mess with them. At this point, there's nothing within our very limited no take, no talk only do a rough assessment and get measurement and photographs. <laughs> and that, uh, there's nothing more that we could do of interest to the Navy. So the only way we could contribute was if we participated in an actual excavation and we're not equipped to do that. We're not trained to do that. Well, this was fascinating. You had me interested in thinking, maybe I'd like to do this until you start talking flesh eating bacteria. I backed away when you said flesh eating bacteria and possible water snakes. Um, that wasn't my favorite, <laughs> but obviously there are so many other needs you have. And I truly didn't realize it was on an all volunteer organization. So it's extremely impressive to say the least. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thanks for the chance to tell people about it. Absolutely. Thank okay. you so much. I, um, this has been so wonderful. I, I know for there are many people you haven't been able to see that have been saying hi, including Susan Langley, Meredith and Bob Taylor, so many others who have thoroughly enjoyed the talk, loved being part of it. So even though you can't hear them, everybody's clapping with me right now for you. Thank you so much. Thank A special you. hi to Philip Norman in the UK. There you go. Uh, thank you to the Boeing Company for making this possible. Um, we are so glad to be able to do this virtually. If you can't come to us, we are thrilled to bring this to you. Um, there are going to be changes coming on at Sauterly. We're going to be opening up for limited time for guided tours in July. There are going to be other events and things going on. If you're a member or supporter of Sauterly, you've helped us get here today. This is a difficult time when we can't, we also can't raise money and a lot of the money we raise is with uh, special events. So for all of our members and donors, people who have been making a donation, we thank you so much. If you're not a member or donor yet, we can we'd love you to join the family, uh, monthly donor membership, whatever you'd like. It helps keep everything going. So thank you to the Boeing thank you for company for making this possible. Dave, you were fabulous. Thank you so yeah. much to our participants. Thank you for joining us. Remember, you can watch all of them again. You're going to love this so much. Dave is going to said so much. You can't remember it. You get to watch it again. All the speaker series will be online on Sarley's website and YouTube page. Take care. Thanks, everybody.
Have a great evening. Hey, Will. I put my mask back on now. <laughs> Be safe. Be safe.